We're back with Neil deGrasse Tyson. He is one of the fabulous people in this country, one of my favorite guests. I'd like to do, I'd like to tour with you. Just, we do universities and I ask questions and we explore things. Okay, you're the scientist. Bring it on, bring it on. Bring it on. You accept facts, facts and belief. I know the religious people believe, the scientist has proved. What do you believe? What do you think happens when we die? Well, so I, I, I can make some unassailable statements about what happens when you die. So you spend your life eating food. Food has a calorie content, and calorie is a source of energy. Calorie is a unit of energy. You bring it in, and then the energy is available for you to maintain your body temperature at nearly 100 degrees. It's 98.6. How do you keep something at 100 degrees when nothing else around you is? You're burning energy to sustain that. Because biologically, we need to be at that temperature to function, okay? You also need energy to walk and to move. That's why you eat food. The moment you die, what happens? You don't maintain the energy. Your temperature drops. How far does it drop? To room temperature. At a funeral in the casket, if you touch the hand of the person in the casket, your first thought is, the body's cold. No, it's not, it's room temperature. But it's cold compared to 100 degrees. They're no longer burning this energy. Okay, so now, every one of your molecules has energy within it. If you get cremated, that energy gets released in the form of heat. And you heat the air, and that air radiates to space. You get buried, which is how I wanna my body to be disposed of, bury me. Bury me, because you know why? I don't want the energy content of my body to just get radiated out into space of no use to anybody. Put me in the ground. Let the worms, microbes, come in and out of my body. And the energy content of my body that I had assembled over my lifetime, consuming the flora and fauna of this earth, my body then returns to them and thus is the cycle of life. I know that's gonna happen because you can measure where the energy goes. And that's how I wanna go out. But you're not conscious and that's for eternity, right? Uh, yeah, that there's no evidence that I have any consciousness of anything. And by the way, is that so weird? Did you have consciousness before you were born? Were you saying, how come I'm not on earth? My gosh, I need to be on earth. Or how come, where am I? No, you, there's just the state of non-existence. Oh. And so I'm not given any yeah, reason. Yeah, but now I am born, okay. and I can't stand the thought of non-existence. See, I already have existence. I don't, I accept okay. it. Okay, it is true. We fear death because we're born knowing only life. Right. I get that. However, I, I, I t take another view, because I've been asked, if you could live forever, would you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're well, done on the interview. The <laughs> yes. Uh, no, okay, sure, that's an attractive idea. But the way I look at it is, it is the knowledge that I'm going to die that creates the focus that I bring to being alive. The urgency of accomplishment, the need to express love now, not later. If we live forever, why ever even get out of bed in the morning? Because you always have tomorrow. That's not the kind of life I want to lead. But why, don't you fear not being around? I fear living a life where I could have accomplished something and didn't. That's what I fear. I, I don't fear death. You don't fear the unknown? I love the unknown. I, 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 I love the, you know what I want on my tombstone? My sister has this in her, in her notes, because in case I can't tell anyone after I die. On my tombstone, a quote from Horace Mann, great educator. Be ashamed to die until you have scored some victory for humanity. That's what I want on my tombstone. But you don't fear or, or think about not being around. 
My great regret for not being around would be, it would be kind of cool to see my kids continue yeah, to Don't grow. you want to know that? Yeah, that'd be, I would, that'd be fun. I want to see what inventions would make life easier, what clever discoveries or innovations would arise out of the collective brain work what of, do you of my think, species. What do you think when you see religious people, when you see popes or rabbis or people who fervently believe, the Billy Grahams mm -hmm. of the world, who are sincere and wonderful people. Yeah, of course. Who actually maybe delusional that they're going somewhere? No, they're, they're, they're embedded in belief systems. And what I look at is I see all the belief systems and when you line them up, they're not really compatible with one another. So whatever they're believing, it can't be a truth that applies to everybody because other people believe what they do with no less fervor. And so I sit back and as a person who's interested in, ob in objective truths and I say, well, it doesn't look like that's a path towards an objective truth. So let people continue to think and say what they want. But as a citizen of a country that is not founded on a, on a, on a, on a religion, it's founded with, with sort of a secular construct in a way that protects whatever religion you want to express. This is protected in the Constitution. The Constitution doesn't actually mention God. Right. R rather controversial in its day. And the, the, it doesn't mention God because they don't want legislation to tell you what God to worship. They knew this. They knew how governments can persecute people who had belief systems that didn't agree with the state. They knew this. So they created those freedoms. And so we have these freedoms. Go ahead. But if you're gonna create legislation that has to apply to everybody, and you're now gonna put your belief system into legislation, that is not a free and open democracy. And you are an amazing man. No, the universe is amazing. I'm just revealing that fact. Thanks to my guest, Neil deGrasse Tyson.